Okay, thanks very much, Thierry. Uh, so today, I, as, as has been mentioned by Emily and Thierry, I'll be speaking about open land contracts, which is a, a, a new online database or repository for large-scale land, agriculture, and forestry contracts. Um, I'm briefly going to provide a bit of context about these sorts of deals and why the contracts are important before then introducing the tool and talking about how it contributes to transparency, the, tra the challenges that we face, um, how it can and cannot contribute to best practices, and then most importantly for today's discussion, how uh, the tool can be used practically by people uh, in countries affected by large-scale land-based investments. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are aware of uh, investment contracts and how they impact on land deals. Um, land deals or investments in land are governed by a wide range of different types of legal frameworks. So we obviously have the laws of the host country. Um, international law impact creates obligations on the host state, you know, things like international human rights law, international environmental law, and international investment law. Um, the investor might be bound by certain laws from the home state where the investor is registered, so things like anti-bribery laws or stock exchange listing laws. And then we have international standards and best practices. So if the IFC is involved, their performance standards will apply. Um, and then finally, we have contracts between different players in the investment, so between the investor and the state, but also um, between the investor and financiers, there might be service providers, um, contracts with the communities and so on. And the type of, in, of contract that we're focusing on today is the investment contract that's often entered into between the host government and the investor. These are important because they create additional obligations than those that exist under the domestic law. And they can also limit how domestic laws apply so they can um, limit how tax laws apply, for example. Um, they, are also, they also tend to be negotiated without public involvement or participation and are rarely disclosed to the public. And this is extremely problematic given the uh, severe human rights impacts on local communities that are often caused by land-based investments. Uh, open land contracts, like I said, is a repository of, of these investment contracts. Uh, it features publicly available contracts that, as they apply to land, agriculture, and forestry projects. And it's freely available to all users. This is what the home screen of Open Land Contracts, or OLC, looks like. Uh, the, the database features the full text of contracts, and it's in both text form and PDF uh, scan of the contract itself. Uh, we also have plain language summaries or annotations for the contract's key social, environmental, fiscal, and operational provisions. And these are designed to make the contract more understandable for people that don't have experience with contracts or people without legal training. And then we also tag each contract with metadata, basic information about the country the, the project is in, what resource is involved, and so on, so that users can um, more powerfully search through the database to find particular types of contracts that they're interested in. And here's just a very quick screenshot of what that search, what the different search uh, functionalities look like. So you can see you can search by year, by country, by resource, and so on. And then this is just to give you a sense of what these plain language, plain language summaries look like. So here we have the scan of the contract in the middle of the page. Uh, and then on the left-hand side, we have the annotations. So, uh, and at the very top, there's an annotation that summarizes what the contract says about local employment obligations. So open land contracts uh, was developed to promote greater transparency and facilitate the disclosure of land contracts. Um, we also attempt to equip stakeholders with the tools and resources necessary to effectively read and understand the contracts. And that, this is where our plain language annotations fit in. The whole point is to make these contracts more accessible uh, to every type of stakeholder who may or may not be affected by a particular investment. Uh, we also hope to catalyze broader awareness of the implications of land contracts more generally and their underlying deals. Um, and then finally, 
we hope to demonstrate that land contract disclosure is both feasible and valuable. And here our main audience that we're targeting is obviously the host governments who are one of the parties to the contract but who are often reluctant to disclose the contracts. And here's just an example of a blog that presents an argument very concisely as to why uh, it's not going to be the end of the world if contracts are disclosed. In, in the extractive industries we've already seen much more extensive disclosure of contracts and the sky has not fallen in. If anything it's actually made life much easier for governments who can now see what other governments are negotiating and um, develop new ideas. Okay. And so then we move to the challenges. The first is uh, how do we convince governments to disclose? Uh, like I said, there are less agricultural contracts in the public arena than there are extractive industries contracts. And that's partially because we don't have an agricultural equivalent to the EITI. Um, we try to link government commitment, we, we try to link in with government commitments under initiatives like the Open Government Partnership, where some countries have already committed to contract disclosure outside of extractive industries. And we also stress with, when we are speaking to governments that we don't leak contracts for the first time. Instead, we work with governments to try and facilitate their disclosure. Uh, a second challenge, like Emily mentioned, is always present with these sorts of tools is reliability and credibility of the information and data that's being presented. We have a contract disclosure policy that sets out when we will feel comfortable disclosing contracts and a lot of the time it comes down to whether the person who has provided the contract to us can, can has a kind of chain of custody back to uh, the original parties to the contract. Uh, but it, also, it also, also is an issue of framing and we take pains to stress that the publicly available version of a contract may not necessarily be the final version or the only version that's regulating the project. Um, so unfortunately that's as, as much as we can do to really present what is publicly available um, without creating over-reliance on a document that might not be the last word on, on the particular deal. And then uh, dissemination to communities. Obviously a lot of the time communities will not have access to internet which makes a portal like this less accept accessible. Um, we have developed uh, the ability to batch download contracts and annotations. Uh, so that paralegals or advisors who are attending specific communities can actually download annotations for contracts impacting on deals uh, that are relevant to those communities to, as a way to try and bridge this internet gap. And then finally, the question of best practices. Just because we're presenting these contracts does not mean that we're endorsing that any particular contract is a good model or a bad model. Rather, we're trying to encourage people to understand these contracts more um, and we again try and make, sh make that very clear in the framing of the site. Um, I'll skip that slide just because I am aware of the time. So on to practical uses. Uh, we recently had a mini grants program uh, where we offered small amounts of money to uh, applicants who had ideas for innovative uses of open land contracts. As a result, the Centre for Environment and Development in the Cameroon uh, was one of the successful grantees and they will be testing guidance on understanding and monitoring these types of contracts uh, using open land contracts. They'll focus on the SG SOC palm oil concession in Cameroon and I've included a link on the slide there for anybody who wants to see how that contract is presented on our site. We also have a journalist from the Thompson Reuters Foundation who will be visiting uh, sites of where these contracts take place to actually compare how they are presented on open land contracts with the realities on the ground. And then we have uh, contract exercises um, and other training materials on our website that can be integrated into um, other training and capacity building efforts. And we're obviously always open to collaborating with other NGOs if there are particular ideas. Which leads me to the final slide. Um, we do believe that open land contracts is a tool for empowerment. Uh, it's designed for users without legal training. Um, the annotations are kind of a key bridge here. Uh, it can help advisors and community members understand contracts, governing projects, and we also think it can assist communities who 
want to carry out community-led monitoring efforts or other types of uh, efforts to hold the parties to account. Uh, and more generally, contracts are another source of enforceable rights, which means they're a pressure point for civil society. Communities can use them as a platform for advocacy, on legal reform, on better contracting practices, on the government's failure to monitor the investment or enforce the contract, and so on. Um, so I'll end it there and very much looking forward to the discussion afterwards.